<laughs> Hi, folks. How are you? Mel, there's a seat right up front if you want. Uh, there are a couple of seats for those of you in the back. Uh, please join us. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm founder of the American Strategy Program, a senior fellow at New America, and I'm Washington editor-at-large of The Atlantic um, magazine. And it is terrific to have all of you here. Uh, we are streaming on many uh, li live on many uh, websites. So hello to The Atlantic crowd, Washington Note crowd, New America Foundation crowd, and I want to thank uh, the staff and team at the New America Foundation and Democracy, uh, a journal of ideas for the excellent back work that they did, uh, part particularly during the holidays, to make t today's event come together. Um, I don't think there's a topic more significant than the one we're discussing today uh, when it comes to the broad question of America's engagement in the world. We're sitting in a year of choice. Uh, in 2012, we've been watching the GOP debates, occasionally uh, hearing comments from President Obama. And, and if we were doing this four years ago or eight years ago at various times, um, and you benchmark the kind of discussion we would have had, every time we, we, we jump ahead another four years, I feel as if uh, the consequences around this debate um, are staggering. And the notion of where America is going to go, what vector, what course it will, will take in the next four years has a lot to do uh, with whether we'll be doing this yet again. Uh, but we'll be looking at the, at the tail end of a debate, having seen uh, substantial, well, I think we have seen substantial American decline in my view. I don't think that's shared by everyone here. But asking about what America's purpose and place in the world is. Uh, this series of articles that we're profiling today that have appeared in Democracy, a Journal of Ideas, was pulled together uh, by Michael Tomaski. Uh, the editor of this, this fantastic journal. And today we have some of the authors of this series. Charlie Kupchin, who's a uh, professor at Georgetown University, a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Rosa Brooks, who's a professor at Georgetown Law Center uh, and a, a esteemed fellow here at the New America Foundation, a colleague. Uh, Congressman Tom Perriello uh, was here. And uh, I just noticed a new title as CEO of the uh, Center for American Progress Action Fund. I hope that's right. Uh, so Tom is employed again. Uh, that's good, but one of my favorite congressmen, or former congressmen. And then Bruce Gentleson, uh, who's a professor at Duke University uh, and, and also a, a very well-known and well-respected author in this field. An advisor, has been an advisor to the Department of State uh, Section of Policy Planning. So the, the essays that have come forward really wrestle with this question of what progressive foreign policy should be. Um, I've entered the debate, and I'm going to uh, uh, allow Michael to come over and talk about this. I just sort of felt like, wow, if it was a series of articles I wanted to play in, this was it. So I decided to take on Charlie Kupchin. Um, and, and look at these fundamental questions of if you were looking at America's stock of power today, where it is today, as opposed to where we would have liked four years ago, what would you do to reinvent America's position? What kinds of things do you do uh, to, to try to uh, build momentum again, re-engage? What are the requirements of, of a, a, an ascendant America? And that, in my view, is going to require negotiations that, that looks something like a new global social contract with other key stakeholders in the system. And it's going to require somewhat a lot of uh, humility and reinvention in the United States because much of the debate, and I hope we get into it here, um, and we've seen it in the GOP debate, sort of asserts that U.S. power is just there. It's static, it's constant, it's strong. You can assert it, you can you know, sort of invent it, and, and, and uh, uh, it will be there. And I think there hasn't really been a discussion that I've been satisfied with in the GOP debate, except from John Huntsman, on the real constraints in American power and the real limits today. So without further ado, let me invite my colleague, Mike Tomaski, editor of Democracy, to take the floor. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. Uh, oh, thanks. Please. Um, <clears throat> Steve, thanks a million for putting this together. Uh, we're very, very grateful to you. Uh, democracy is a small little thing, and we don't have the, the resources or the muscle to do something like this. And you and New America do. Thanks to everyone who did anything for this, uh, you know, help publicize it, put out the chairs. We're very grateful. Uh, I just want to be very quick and talk a little bit about the journal and uh, specific, a little bit more specifically about what this series of articles is about. Uh, I'm sure many of you, we, we always encounter this at events that, that many people haven't, haven't uh, been introduced to democracy before. So democracy is a liberal progressive quarterly journal that has existed for about six years. I've been with it for two and a half, uh, I believe, something along those lines. Um, uh, sometime in the middle of 2009, uh, we, uh, watching the ebb and flow of political events, uh, uh, decided that we would launch a series of articles that we called uh, 
first principles. Um, this was a point at which, do you remember, uh, rather fierce opposition to Obama and his whole agenda had sprung up quite dramatically. Um, <clears throat> it seemed then that uh, everything uh, was being contested. Everything about American politics and ideas was being contested. The role of government, how to build an economy, uh, our civic culture, our role in the world. Uh, everything was being very, very fiercely contested. We decided that we wanted to do a series of articles that would uh, try to restate and reframe uh, uh, progressive first principles for this new era in a way that would make articles both timeless and useful five or 10 or even 20 years from now, but also very uh, wedded to the moment. So that's what the assignment of these four authors and our fifth author was. The fifth author, incidentally, is out of town, uh, but she wrote also a terrific piece, which I commend to all of you. This was Rachel Kleinfeld of the Truman National Security Project. I'm sure many of you know Rachel, and she wrote about what she called the awakening world, how America should r react to the, um, uh, you know, the, the greater realization among people in the developing world of their situation their greater strivings for, for democracy, for, for freedom. And she wrote a terrific piece. But these four also wrote terrific pieces. We're going to go in direct order down the row. They each have seven minutes. Um, oh, I want to take a, a moment just to mention also my colleagues at Democracy, the managing editor, Albert Ventura, associate editor, Jack Meserve, obviously edited all these articles with me. It's just the three of us in a small office, and, um, and we work pretty hard on editing these articles, as uh, our panelists might uh, might agree. Uh, in many ways, the most important man in the room today is our intern this semester, Michael Fantuzo, who's the timekeeper. And the four of you are going to look at him because he brought his little cards. And, uh, and I'm going to enforce this. Uh, you each have seven minutes to summarize your articles. Then we'll move forward to discussion. I'll let Steve uh, ask the first question because Steve, as he referenced, uh, wrote something in response to what Charlie wrote, and I want to get that conversation going. I have one question that I want to ask everyone, at least one question. Then we'll open it up to you. There are a lot of you. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Uh, so that said, I think I'm done. Charlie Cupchin wrote about the question of progressive grand strategy. Thanks, uh, Mike. I think I'll, I'll stand up here just so that when I get the card that says stop, I can pretend not to see it over there uh, in the corner. Let me uh, begin just by thanking Mike, not just for uh, having the good sense to reach out to the five of us, including Rachel, but also for editing a journal that has filled not just a niche in Washington, but I think what was a gaping hole in, in public debate. And it really has done a, a remarkable job of getting out uh, a progressive voice on lots of different issues when, when that voice, I think, didn't have sufficient uh, weight and sufficient volume in, in public debate. So kudos to you, Mike. And also to, to Steve, who I think has cornered the market on, on putting together interesting groups and, and, uh, and getting, uh, getting people to think creatively about a whole host of, of issues. In the, uh, the piece that I wrote for uh, this issue, I, I tried to sort of step back from the details of policy and ask what kind of defining concepts, what tenets would I identify uh, as, as foundational to a progressive set of first principles on grand strategy moving forward. And the four that I identified were Grand strategy starts at home, the need for economic and political solvency. Two, retrenchment, the importance of striking a new balance between America's resources and commitments. Third, the importance of a new bargain between the West and the emerging rest. And then finally, a consolidation of the Atlantic community. Let me take a couple minutes and just flesh out each of those four points. First, I think the, the, the most important idea would be, as I said, that grand strategy starts at home. If we do not get our act together economically and politically, our paralysis, our weakening at home will be reflected in our weakening abroad. And in the first instance, that means making sure that our economy is up to the task, making sure that we have sufficient 
economic base and sufficient economic growth to sustain our diplomacy abroad, to sustain what we take to be adequate levels of defense spending, to sustain development assistance. That's kind of a no-brainer. But I would make a secondary argument, and that is that restoring economic solvency is critical to restoring political solvency. That the crisis of governance that we face here in the United States is fundamentally about the downturn in the welfare of America's middle class. A political system that is beholden to special interests, a political and economic system that favors the advantaged few over the many. And historically, when we have seen the rising middle class move to the center of the political spectrum and marry with, uh, with uh, both Democrats and Republicans, you have bipartisanship on foreign policy. The bipartisanship that was born after World War II was made possible by the rising fortunes of the American economy. I think the onset of partisanship, the split that has emerged both on domestic and, ec and foreign policy issues over the last decade or two, is fundamentally related to our economic problems and to economic inequality in this country. Class is returning as a source of ideological division. And in that sense, a plan for economic renewal, a plan for less economic inequality, a plan for making sure that America's middle class has expectations about the future that are equal to the expectations of the past, this is central to restoring not just the health of the United States economically, but its political health. And historically speaking, when the United States is divided at home, it is weak abroad. When the United States is united at home, it is strong abroad. Second point, I think that we are facing a growing gap between our resources and our commitments, in part because we are going to have to whack the defense budget to bring our debt down, but also because our commitments abroad have come to outstrip our interests. That's particularly true in Iraq. I think it is also true in Afghanistan. And in the first instance, retrenchment means not just cutting the defense budget, but also cutting our commitments. Not in, a, in, not in the sense of a retreat, not in the sense of a, a, a polist vision, but in the sense of re-equilibrating our interests and our commitments and our resources so that our commitments abroad are more in keeping with our core interests and the resources that we have to sustain them. In the first instance, it does mean a, uh, a keeping ourselves at a distance from Iraq, rapid downsizing in Afghanistan, but also relying more heavily on allies and, uh, inter and international regional institutions in other parts of the world. I think the Republicans don't get this. One wing of the party would have uh, a foreign policy that outstrips means, no limits on our nature of our commitments, and the other wing of the Republican Party would do far too little, that is to say, to deny the country sufficient means to pursue even necessary ends. Third point, I think that the dominant view in Washington is that even if we are going through a period of, of, of uh, diminishment in Western primacy, the Western order is stable. That's the view, I think, on both the left and right. And the view that I articulate in the article is that not only do we, are we moving to a world in which we will have to deal with the rise of the rest, but also a world in which there are alternative versions of modernity. That the Chinese, that the Russians, the Indonesians, the Indians, the Brazilians, they are not going to buy into the world that has been created by Americans and Europeans since the onset of globalization in the 19th century. And in that sense, a top priority is sitting down at the table and striking a new bargain with emerging powers not just about a new distribution of power, but a new set of rules to anchor a rules-based international system. Final point, and, and Steve uh, took me to task for this point, I end by saying that we need to consolidate and breathe new life into the Atlantic community. And I made that point not to say that the Pacific pivot is incorrect. Not to say that, of course, we don't need to focus our assets more on the Middle East and more on East Asia, but to say, let's not forget the Atlantic community. But to say, precisely because we are moving to a world no longer dominated by the West, we need to sure that the United, ensure that the United States and Europe hang together as a community of liberal values, 
as a community that, would, that attempts to protect and expand the values that the United States holds dear and continues to prize as vital, even as we see a world emerge that embraces a much broader and more pluralistic set of norms when it comes to both domestic and international governance. Thank you. We have a couple of big picture pieces. That's Kupchin and Gentleson, and then a couple of pieces that looked at more specific issue areas. Uh, Rosa Brooks wrote about democracy promotion. Thanks very much, Michael and Steve. Thanks for putting this on. Um, I, I, I should start out by saying that when uh, Michael asked me to do a piece on uh, democracy promotion and, and whether and why it should be a, a important aspect of progressive foreign policy, uh, my first reaction was that I was the wrong person to write about democracy promotion because I've always been a skeptic uh, of, of how we do it, if not of whether we should do it. Um, in the end, though, partly by forcing myself to go through the process of, of thinking about it in a different way than I had before, I decided that perhaps that meant that I was the right person to write about it because I was a skeptic. So, so let me start out with, with, the, with the skeptical note that I think actually at this point, uh, certainly, certainly a few years ago, many of us brought to the subject of democracy promotion. Uh, it was a pretty tarnished idea. Um, leave aside the Cold War history of democracy promotion, which is a whole story unto itself and not a particularly uh, uplifting one. Uh, look simply at the Bush administration's approach to democracy promotion uh, by military force uh, at the, the freedom agenda of the Bush administration. And it's not particularly hard to see why the notion of democracy promotion became something anathema. Uh, not only in the progressive community, but in many other parts of the world as well. It became bound up with the Iraq war, it bound up with some of the worst aspects of the post 9-11 Bush era, our, our brief, thank goodness, embrace of torture, et cetera. It's all of the abuses that you can think of. So nobody liked democracy promotion. Uh, and in the article, I actually talk about a couple of times during the, my recent stint at the Defense Department where, where we accidentally stuck the word democracy into a few uh, uh, speeches and testimony and were, were roundly uh, slapped back down again. The administration, the Obama administration, wanted to put that term behind them. Um, that, of course, had to change because to everyone's surprise, uh, when the Arab Spring came along, uh, suddenly it looked like we didn't wasn't up to us to decide whether democracy and democracy promotion was a good idea. There were a lot of other people who were coming along who had their own views on it, who weren't actually particularly interested in ours. Uh, and democracy, again, became one of the rallying cries for protesters around the world. And uh, what that did, of course, was it forced the Obama administration to backpedal pretty rapidly and say, actually, oh, yes, democracy uh, supporting democratic traditions is indeed one of our foreign policy goals. Um, that said, we were always still a bit of a beat behind, uh, and I think that this is a good time as we go into an election year uh, to think again about whether, how, how should we feel, not just about democracy, but about democracy promotion. Uh, so first principles, can we rescue democracy promotion from all of our mistakes, all of our hypocrisies, all of our false starts and hesitations? And I think the answer is yes, not, not despite all those hypocrisies, mistakes, hesitations, but in fact because of them. Uh, we should embrace democracy and democracy promotion not because democracy is perfect, uh, but because democracy is really the only political system that humans have yet managed to come up with that builds in the capacity to self-correct. Uh, so what's the core idea of democracy? I'm not a political theorist, um, so this is just my version. Seems to me the core idea remains that everybody counts. Everybody gets to participate. No one person or group of people has a monopoly on political wisdom. Uh, and that carries with it some at least minimalist assumptions about human rights, some minimalist assumptions about free expression, free assembly, the rule of law, some set of institutions to guarantee those things. Uh, here's the problem. If everybody counts, if, if no one has a monopoly on wisdom, uh, if worthy ideas can come from anyone, pernicious ideas, of course, can also come from pretty much anyone. Um, and that's why we need democracy. We need democracy because we will get things wrong repeatedly over and over. 
This is why progressives, I think, should care about democracy promotion, not out of some sort of triumphalist American exceptionalism, but rather out of the deep sense of humility that should come for us from knowing that we ourselves are deeply imperfect. Our history of slavery, genocide, uh, Japanese internment during World War II, denial of the vote, and you name it, we, we can all come up with that history. Uh, our progress is still uneven. We still have many, many problems. Um, our democracy has produced bad policies with pretty impressive regularity, but our democracy is also what has yet managed to enable us to repudiate those things, however slowly, however imperfectly, over time. Uh, Democracy, I think, in that sense, is a necessary concomitant to a belief in human fallibility. It enshrines that capacity for self-correction. Uh, and that's why we should care about it. Um, so implications of this uh, for progressives. I think it leads us to four precepts for if we think about democracy promotion. If we think it's a good thing, then we should want to promote it. But there ought to be four precepts that should guide us. We should do it with honesty, with humility, with patience, and with realism. Honesty, that's the bare minimum prerequisite, and that means acknowledging mistakes and hypocrisies and acknowledging that we're going to do it again, too, by the way. That, that's, the, that's the nature of the thing. Uh, humility means that we need to recognize what we don't know, and what we don't know is a lot. Uh, I think even the, the biggest experts on democracy promotion are often the first to say, we don't really know what set of institutional arrangements best guarantees democracy. We don't really know exactly the contours of the political rights that are essential to it are and how we should do it. People do this different ways. We're often stumbling around in the dark when we do it. Uh, and we often do the most harm when we think that we are doing the most good, when we're most certain that we are doing the most good. Three, patience. Uh, I think we often fall into one of two equal and opposite errors. Either we Either we're absolutely unrealistic and we think we can, we with the help of the international community will bring democracy to country X in a few years, or we get irritated when country X does not appear to be a fully fledged democracy in a few years and we say to ourselves, well, they're just not ready for it, they don't want it, they're not interested and we give up. Uh, doesn't make any sense to me. Our democracy was not created in a decade as a result of a nice package of technical assistance from the World Bank. Um, <laughs> Our democracy was achieved through uh, not only our own revolution and the bloodshed that went with it, and the civil war and the bloodshed that went with that. It, it, we stand on the shoulders of generations of other people who struggled and fought and made mistakes. It was a pretty long, hard slog from Athens through the Magna Carta, through the Declaration of the Rights of Man, you name it. It took a long time. Uh, and indeed, I'm told that I'm taking a long time, but I will finish very soon. Uh, unlike democracy, I will be done quickly with this. Um, why would we imagine that other societies will transform overnight, other societies that don't have that particular history of struggle? Um, I think that technological changes, communications changes, probably have accelerated the rate at which cultures and polities can now change, but it's not going to be overnight by any means. Um, and indeed, rushing democracy can undermine it very badly. Finally, realistic. Uh, we should know from the last 50 years that there will, the political will for democracy promotion, rule of law promotion, human rights promotion, all these related things, uh, the political will will be uneven. The resources will be too few and will also be uneven. We will go from feast to famine over and over again. And yet, we continue to act, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan or other places around the globe, uh, as though political will will be enduring and as though resources will continue to flow. And so we develop relatively grandiose projects, which then become unsustainable and sometimes actually end up doing more harm than good, uh, which is left fledging democracies strewn with the wreckage of abandoned projects. What is final? Finally, what should this mean in practice for how we think about it? I, you know, I actually think that when we're thinking of those, those democracy promotion programs abroad, that we are going to undertake, we should ask ourselves a pretty simple question, uh, which is, if this project had to stop, had to be completely abandoned in a year, uh, would it still have done more good, than, more good than harm? And if the answer to that is no, we probably shouldn't be doing it. Uh, we shouldn't, of course, be doing it altogether some of the time. Sometimes diplomacy is a more useful tool. Sometimes giving others the tools to do something is more useful tool, is more useful. Sometimes trying to encourage the private sector to act is going to be more useful than governmental action. I think that the Obama administration has inched its way 
uh, towards a pretty good under a pretty good approach to democracy promotion uh, as a result of the Arab Spring. I think we now have a nuanced and sophisticated approach in theory. And I think the big question for all of us as we move forward will be, can we, in fact, put this into practice? Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, so Tom, I'll just introduce the next two so I don't take up any more time than I have, absolutely have to. Tom Periello wrote about uh, humanitarian intervention, and Bruce Gentleson we asked to write about something we called the multipolar world. Well, thank you very much for uh, including me in this and uh, for asking these questions. Um, it's, I want to start with some context, which I think may be uh, clear to those present, but I think it's important to be asking these questions in this context because it's unusual, and Steve alluded to some of this at the beginning. One is we are entering an election cycle in which it's quite possible that the progressives are going to be on offense about national security and the Republicans may well be on defense. Uh, we saw some serious defeats on the national security front in the previous administration uh, and some quite uh, stunning victories in the last few years in this one, and that's not always been the case. The second bit of context that's relevant to that uh, is that while progressives may well be on offense about national security, progressives are deeply divided uh, about some of these victories and some of the tactics that have been used. Uh, and so this is a moment, I think, in a great panel um, and process to step out of the political campaign environment, which I think we have been reminded in New Hampshire and Iowa is not prone to nuance and substance, um, to ask the question about how we feel about some of these developments of the last few years. And again, some, I would say, stunning victories on the national security front, um, but also continuing to deal with both moral and legal questions as well as technological ones. The third bit of context is that we are continuing to evaluate the idea of U.S. foreign policy at a time where arguably it has less and less of a monopoly or dominance over the actual development of events around the world, something that I think in the context of Arab Spring we have seen. Now, this doesn't mean it's not incredibly powerful, um, but we also see a world, and this goes to, uh, I think, what will be said next in part from Bruce, uh, what kind of world we're, we're living in. Um, so it's an, I just want to uh, say that in that context. And I do want to address quickly, while I do not want to in any way replace uh, Steve's inimitable role, uh, but to address the, the previous two comments very quickly uh, before getting to my my, my work on humanitarian intervention. Um, on uh, Mr. Kupchin's piece, I just want to echo what a big deal it is to see this relationship between our domestic strength and our foreign policy. I spent much of last year in the Middle East, uh, most uh, prominently in Egypt, uh, about six different trips there at different periods during the revolution. And people there, both the revolutionaries and people on the street, were so cognizant about this perception of a concentration of wealth in the United States, of the fragility of the economic system. Uh, many people have talked about comparisons between the Berlin Wall moment and the Arab Spring moment and how things have gone differently. There are many reasons for that. But one is at that time, democratic capitalism was associated with prosperity and with strength. And I can't tell you how many times when I would be interviewing people on the streets of Cairo or in Upper Egypt, and people would say, oh, well, we don't want that. We tried that under Mubarak. Uh, there was an association of crony capitalism with some of this. Now, we're not going to get into how accurate those critiques are here, but there is a perception. There's a very strong perception or connection between how our economy is doing and some of this influence overseas. And I would argue to uh, some of our conservative uh, friends who talk about American exceptionalism that there are probably has been no greater blow to American exceptionalism in recent years than the conservatives' handling of the debt fight. And I was overseas for most of that, not only in the Middle East, but with many people from Europe and Asia and elsewhere who were working there. And it was a stunning example of how a failure uh, and falling apart of functional governance here, right up until the end when it really failed to come together, uh, there was still some sense that America would work it out, that America would figure it out. Um, and and it, did, it did start to change, I think, people's perception there. So it's a very important thing. Um, 
On on Rosa's, I think she she raises a lot of important points about humility, and she's been an important mentor of mine. Uh, and so I always learn something from that experience. I do think that what we're seeing, particularly in a non-governmental perspective, is the idea that this distinction between us and them on the democracy agenda is disappearing. That there's much more talk by non-state actors of needing to revive or revitalize democracy in the United States and overseas, not as an othering or us-them conversation, um, but as a new generation a new century with new technology and new volumes and concentration of wealth, looking at what that democracy means. So on the article about humanitarian intervention, I'm making a very simple point, which is when we go through World War II and look at the use of force, we saw, uh, for those of us who see it in history books, um, an absolutely devastating war that we still see as a noble war because it was the ultimate moral and existential security threat. Through the use in Vietnam and elsewhere, there was increasing skepticism both of that cost of war and also people's legitimization of the use of force. So there has been an assumption by many liberals of a, a, an extreme hesitancy on the use of force, even in the face of mass atrocities, with the logic of saying, well, no matter what, if we use it, we're going to end up doing more harm than good anyway. And I believe we have reached a tipping point where that is no longer a morally defensible position. Uh, the cost of inaction in the face of atrocities and in the, in the face of certain grave threats um, is, in, is immoral in the context of what we're looking at. And there are two major factors, I think, to look at in the use of force. One is what is the cost, the human cost in particular, of that use of force. We have developed technologies, not perfect, but have, that have tremendously reduced uh, the costs and casualties of war when employed in certain situations, and I think we've seen that uh, dramatically in the cases of Kosovo uh, and of Libya in recent years. The second is we've had huge expansions in uh, the ways we can legitimize force. If legitimacy is the difference between violence and force, before there was pretty much unilateral action or UN Security Council action. And from about its inception, the Security Council became fairly paralyzed. And that as an ultimate barrier of legitimacy is complicated in its own way, given that many countries in the global south consider it not to be a particularly representative body anyway. What we've seen in recent years with the emergence and expansion of NATO, of various regional alliances, uh, of the African Union and other areas, is the ability to have a different sense of what it means to divide that division between violence and force. So when we look at both the technological legitimacy in our application of force and the legal and regional diplomatic developments that have given us more avenues to divide what is a sort of cowboy adventure from a legitimate use of force, we really do have a different capacity than we had before. And I think progressives have to take that very seriously. And I think should be very proud of the intervention in Libya, not because it was perfect and not because we're anywhere near done with that development that will be there but because we believe in progress. That's core to the idea of being progressive. So the idea that we might actually increase our human capacity to reduce suffering over time is something that we should see as a good thing and be willing to incorporate uh, into our sense of foreign policy. Thank you. So let me also um, thank Steve and New America for uh, the event and, and Mike and democracy a journal for this whole um, approach on first principles. I mean, I think it's really important. We have plenty of a slew of policy analysis out there, this issue, that issue. But the notion of principles, not just in sort of the theoretical sense, but in the terms of frameworks of how we see things like, you know, the role of government in society, America's role in the world, is really, really important uh, for us to be addressing. So let me put my um, comments in the context of foreign, po of foreign policy in the coming presidential election. Uh, now, we all know that the election is going to be predominantly about the economy. That's obvious. Uh, and when you see the polls, maybe 3 to 5 percent of the people say that they're going to pay attention to foreign policy. But you know, in a close election, 3 to 5 percent matters. Uh, and, and so uh, it may well be that winning that debate uh, could be decisive, not as important as the debate on the economy. But I think the notion that foreign policy doesn't matter is wrong. Uh, if it's not a close election, 3 to 5 percent may not matter, but I think it's prudent to, to assume that it's going to be a close election. And in that context, I think that it's going to be much more thematic than issue-based. You know, with the caveat, we don't really know what this year is going to bring. Uh, but at this point in time, there's no issue out there like, you know, 9-11 was in the 2004 election, or Iraq was in 2006, 2008, 
uh, or Iranian hostages and Soviet invasion of Afghanistan were back in, in 1980. Uh, and I think the Republicans are trying to make this thematic along two main themes. One is, I think Steve said this at the beginning, is the declinism theme. Uh, and what they're trying to get at th here is, is both, uh, you know, sort of a bullish notion of American power, uh, but also sort of broadly optimistic, you know, not pessimistic, the old sort of Reagan optimism. You know, Mitt Romney's believe in America. Uh, and the second one, and this has also been mentioned by Tom and others, is American exceptionalism. And that's trying to get at people's pride. You know, we're the best. You know, we're special. Um, and you can understand this strategy, particularly in the current context. Uh, it has some appeal amidst all of the uncertainty and anxiety and fear that people have in, in, in a profoundly changing world. Uh, but I think it can be countered, indeed trumped, uh, in a very progressive way. And so let me address that and put some of the arguments I make in the article in that context. Uh, first, in terms of the declinism argument. Uh, I actually think that the problem is not declinism, uh, but it's really those who sort of are making that argument, their problem is denialism. You know, it's sort of a basic fact of life for any of us as individuals or whatever, that if you don't have a sense of what are the problems and challenges you face, you know, you're not really going to be in a position to, to meet them and figure out strategically. And so I think that really comes down to seeing the world as it is, not as it was or how we might like it to be. So everybody has their metaphor and framework for this. Mine uh, that I use both in a, in a book that was mentioned that I co-authored with a colleague, Steve Weber, at Berkeley, and in this Democracy article, uh, is an astronomical one that goes back to my days as an undergraduate at Cornell when there was a professor named Carl Sagan running around trying to teach all of us non-specialists about, about astronomy. And the notion here is that during the Cold War, we really saw the world like Ptolemy saw the universe. You know, Ptolemy had the Earth at the center, and everything else revolved around it. And to a great extent, that's how we saw the world in the Cold War. The US was at the center. We were the wielder of, of military power, economic dynamism, democracy, you know, and the like. But it really shifted to a Copernican world. Uh, and for Copernicus, you know, everybody had their own orbit. And, and the notion, it's even more than multipolarity. But we live in a world today where there's been a diffusion of power, of economic power, of soft power, uh, a pluralization of diplomacy, uh, and many other aspects, uh, along with sort of a 21st century version of, of, of nationalism and non-alignment. Uh, and we need to understand that other countries in the world are not revolving around us. It doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of power. Uh, but in a Copernican world, uh, you want to think about things in, a, in different ways. And we get, I get into sort of four areas of policy in the article. One is on leadership. Uh, and moving from rhetoric to strategy. And we're basically faced with three different kinds of scenarios. You know, one is a si situation in which interests are shared by a broad swath of the international community, and somebody needs to be the imp impetus to mobilize for collective action. That's Libya to a great extent. And I think we played a very important role there. We didn't do it on our own. Uh, it wasn't, frankly, where we were leading from, uh, but it was where we were leading towards, which was towards results. Uh, and as Tom said, it's not over there, but you know, in the context of norms like the responsibility to protect, as well as the Arab Spring, that was an extremely important situation. There are other situations uh, in which other states see their interests as different than ours. And there I think we need to have what I call in the article sort of a sweet spot partnership strategy that, if you like, is the diplomatic analog to, to coin, to counterinsurgency where to the extent that that had some success in Iraq, it was going into areas like the Sunnis, seeing how they saw their interests and figuring out how to work with that. We need to work with partners, whether it's emerging powers like Brazil and Turkey or China in many situations, and figure out where everybody's sweet spot is uh, and figure out partnerships which are not uh, amount of here's our talking points, follow us, but they're really an effort you know, to use diplomacy to forge those partnerships. Uh, the third kind of situation is where, frankly, others believe their policy ideas for how to organize the international system are to be blunt better than ours. Uh, I think, frankly, some of the ideas about the international financial system, less reliance on the monopoly position of the dollar, would be better for others and better for us. And that really requires acknowledging that not all the best ideas are made in Washington. Um, a second area is this whole area of, of, of the use of force. And here I think Democrats need to shake off the worry about being soft on. I think this administration has shown an understanding 
uh, in many respects about how to effectively use force. I haven't been a supporter of the Afghanistan policy, but in many other areas. And I think we have to, un we have to take our positions on this strategically based upon what works, not worrying in a defensive way that we might look as soft. In other words, we shouldn't leave it to just to people like Robert Gates to show that it's strategic, not soft, to have a high bar in another major war. Two other areas really quick. One relates to the Arab Spring uh, and the notion, and here I think Rose's points about, about democracy promotion. For many years, we sort of followed this notion, as it was said way back, he may be an SOB, but he's our SOB. Uh, you can't sustain, and we tried to give some nodding of the head towards democracy promotion. I think what we learned this year is that's not sustainable. Uh, political Islam is here to stay. Uh, we can't make the same mistake with political Islam that we did during the Cold War with various forms of nationalism in the Third World and write them all off as part of some monolithic movement. We need to differentiate. <coughs> I think the administration is doing better on that with Egypt now than it is, for example, doing on Bahrain. So this is not values over interests. This is the way that, that values are very much part of the strategic picture. Uh, and lastly, uh, and this is one of Charlie's themes, is this notion of the domestic, is what, is what I call in the article mustering strength from within. Uh, and this gets in, to, to the whole question of American exceptionalism. You know, Republicans want to use that as an anesthetic, to ease the pain, to make us feel good about our past. Uh, we need to use it as a stimulant to tap people's pride, to understand, as Charlie said, that you know, national success in the 21st century is less about muscle flexing abroad than strength from within uh, in terms of your policies, uh, in terms of your economy, and other ways. And so we need to enter the American exceptionalism debate, not with peons to the past, but about ways of, of making this a stimulant. We have, we have been great in the past. The way we're going to be great in the 21st century is not the same as in the past because it's a very different world. What does that mean to this next generation and to us going forward? Uh, uh, and to really do it in a way that makes people feel that you know, we're kind of all in this together uh, and there's something that we want to make ourselves proud again uh, without going sort of the anesthetic route about just sort of sitting around with myths. That's not going to help us compete in a 21st century world. Thanks. I want to thank all of you. Um, I also know that someone's going to be coming to take this mic uh, after uh, Mike Tomaski does to, to ask questions in the audience. Um, congratulations to all of you. I think it's an excellent set of essays, and I want to tell those folks that are watching online again uh, that they can access these essays on the Democracy Journal website or on the New America Foundation website or the other places where it's streaming. When we titled this event, we titled it Reformulating American Strategy in a Turbulent World, colon, American Spring. And Michael Tomaski suggested this idea, American Spring, and I put a question mark on the end. Um, and I've been struggling with this question of what, what, what could that mean? And when I think about the notion of what, how we think about the Arab Spring, the American Spring, it's, it's fundamentally asking key questions or disrupting the, the incumbent order, disrupting orthodoxy. And as I took that a next step, I began to ask, well, what is the orthodoxy of the time? Is the orthodoxy one where today, um, a brand of liberal internationalism and neoconservatism have set the pace that America has become an, a, a disruptive, engaged, uh, democracy-promoting interventionist around the world? Or is the orthodoxy one that we've been seeing? It's, it's, it's a pugnacious American nationalism sort of asserting, moving where it wants without real regard to the way gravity works in the world? Or is orthodoxy um, along the lines of a Nixonian, Kissingerian, the substance of foreign policy is still basically realpolitik and, and, and guarding and, and husbanding resources and directing efforts in ways that, that move the national interest forward. Um, last night, uh, and, uh, thanks to Bill Goodfellow, I was a guest at a, an airing of, of, of a movie I highly recommend called uh, In the Land of Blood and Honey that was produced and directed by Angelina Jolie. Um, I'm not normally a big fan of Angelina Jolie, uh, but it is a, it's a stunning movie. It's not about U.S. foreign policy, but it does remind when you see this film about how uh, uh, cycles of violence and history are so much a part of this story. And, and, and when, when you would then ask the next question, which I think both Rosa and, and Tom got into, about what is the right policy response? And, and it's when the, the problem I have with the moral agenda or the promotion agenda is one where I'm all for... America being about better outcomes in the world and better life, as long as the stock of American power 
remains the same or is increased, that American Latin, that you can do tomorrow what you're trying to do today. And I guess my question to all of you is I'd, li I'd, I'd like to just quickly get a snapshot of what you see as your own Arabs, as your own American spring notion, because I sort of see some of you saying we need to revitalize transatlantic relations. We need to be better at democracy promotion. We humanitarian intervention. This to me sounds like all out of the same old playbook to some degree. So what's the, the most important disruptive thing that you think the United States needs to do in its foreign policy portfolio to either reachieve its status or, or to, uh, you know, to, to change the game? Because that, I think, gets at the question of American spring or not. I think that the the contours uh, of American foreign policy moving forward are clear to some extent regardless of who wins the next election. And that is that when you combine the domestic constraints that we face with increasing international constraints, I think we're headed towards some kind of strategic retrenchment. Mm. And the question is how well is it handled and uh, what is the the implication and you know I think because we're progressives we believe that the that that the progressives Obama are better equipped to handle this than uh, the the opposition for reasons that we've all been talking about but I think Bruce put his finger on it when uh, when he when he sort of said that you know the Republicans are going to go for the same old refrain which I agree is denialism it is not uh, a new form of nationalism but to, to an directly answer your question, Steve, I would say that, that the big unknown is here at home. Uh, I think that, that Obama did the right thing by trying to be a post-partisan president. I think he truly believed that if he reached across the aisle, he would find willing partners. Uh, that has not happened. Uh, and he has now moved toward a very different approach to running for re-election. It's an approach that's going to be more combative, that is going to, to try to play to this, this question of the economy that we've talked about. But as I said, I, I, I think that it, you know, this, this kind of period of American history in which we are going through a fundamental change requires domestic consensus. I don't know where that's going to come from. I'm deeply worried about it. I think it is the, the, the $6 million question. Is this, can, is this on? Yes, it's this on. I agree with, with Charlie, actually. And I, I, I want to, by way of agreeing with Charlie, actually maybe challenge something that, that you just said a bit, Steve, uh, about the, the danger of moralism. Do we run the risk that it reduces the, the stock of American power in the world? Uh, I think when misapplied, it certainly can. When, when it's hypocritical, it certainly can. But equally, I think that when the United States is viewed by the world as having failed to step in when good requires it, our prestige and our stock of power also goes down. And that, that's, let me circle that back to, to Charlie's point. I think that historically, when you think of part of what American power in the world has been based on, it's been, it's, it's been based not just on having a big army. Uh, it's been based on the idea that we are a kind of the land of opportunity, the land in which people can choose who they will be and not be forced to be who their ancestors were or who one politician or another tells them that they must be. And that is something that has, for many generations, brought immigrants to this country. It's been the root of a lot of the diversity and, and creativity and innovation in this country. That is still, in many places, thank goodness, something that part of what people think about the United States, that our stock goes up when we are viewed internationally as the, the creators and the guarantors of opportunity, of choice, uh, of change. Re it goes down when we are viewed as the enemies, the destroyers of opportunity and choice and change. I think that part of what we are seeing right here in the United States is a, a tremendous loss of faith on all across the political spectrum in our own idea of ourselves as a land of opportunity and choice and change, rising income inequality, economic uncertainty, 
problems with our public education system, you name it, I think that whether you want to look at the Occupy Wall Street movement or you want to look at the Tea Party, the same animus is there. A lot of anxiety about are we losing that special something that makes us us. And as Charlie said, that could go in a number of different directions. It could go in a really good direction or it could go in a really bad direction. If it goes in a really good direction, I think it will be associated with progressive ideas. It will be associated with a, a humble and honest and realistic but real embrace and promotion of democracy and human rights abroad as part of our foreign policy, which may at times include the use of force for humanitarian reasons. Uh, if it goes in the wrong direction, it will go in the direction of a, of a denialist, head in the sand form of exceptionalism, uh, which could either go in the neoconservative, uh, not grand strategy, grandiose strategy direction, or, or it could go in the Tea Party isolationist direction. I think, I think that that remains to be seen. But I do think that for our foreign policy to go in the progressive direction, we have to care very deeply about what happens here domestically. First of all, I think the most dramatic disruption that could improve our national security would be to end our reliance on oil. Um, I think if you look at what it means in terms of the strength of our economy and, and our <coughs> interdependence and what it means for relationships in some of the most volatile areas in the world, not just the Middle East, um, it is a dramatic blow to our national security that we failed to develop a national energy policy. Um, and, you know, even those who go with the drill baby drill crowd, not only are we never going to get to 100 percent that way, but it's a global commodity. So it actually doesn't change uh, this, the extent to which the conservative position on energy has done more to strengthen Ahmadinejad than just about anything else. And so what, uh, what it would mean to really uh, dramatically increase, I think, our strength is, is that's an example. Um, but I think what um, uh, Dr. Kupchin and others are getting at is this fact that we have rarely in our history had such a big gap between the scale of what we need to accomplish and our political capacity to do it. Uh, I certainly think something like a 10-year rebuild of America's competitive advantage, putting out a real competitiveness strategy, uh, the, the administration rolled out some of that this week, um, is, is vital. Um, and there were those of us that certainly wanted a stronger and more visionary stimulus to do that, uh, seeing this as both a national security issue and a middle class issue rather than, you know, a short term um, a push to the economy to prevent a depression, which itself was a, um, was a notable act uh, of, of intervention. So I think that's the scale of things that, that really dramatically improves our security rather than on the margins. I think beyond that, you know, the irony of the Iraq intervention was that it was supposed to put a chill in dictators around the world to reinforce with shock and awe our capacity to remove. Unfortunately, with how it developed, it had exactly the opposite uh, impact. I do think Libya and other interventions and the use, and uh, I know that uh, the, the organization I've just joined is going to be doing a lot of uh, thinking on the drone issue this year. There, there's some very difficult questions out there um, that could be part of this question of how do you do some of this with fewer resources, but, but present a credible and robust threat in addition to uh, hopefully uh, you know, the soft power elements that I think most of us agree on. Just a couple of points, Steve. Um, you know, I think it's really about being savvy. You know, in terms of the stock of power, it's like being an investor. How do you leverage, you know, limited investments and get the return you want? So two examples. One I think, is, I think has been done well, the other I'm less sure of. So the whole South China Sea. I think one of the best strategies this administration has had goes back to 2010 when Secretary Clinton went off to the ASEAN meetings uh, and was pushed not just by Korea and Japan, but by Indonesia and Vietnam to basically balance against China. You know, China too, the notion of the Copernican world is that it's not a world where anybody can be a hegemon. There's too much nationalism, pride, national interest, identity out there, and there's too much diffusion of power in lots of ways. So I think, you know, China, which, you know, really for maybe the better part of two decades had been, really, I think, emerging regionally in ways that was surprising to many of the countries there that it wasn't as threatening. And then they started to overplay their hand. Uh, if we overplay our hand and turn this into, you know, what I think a lot of the Republicans want, you know, sort of a zero-sum, you know, bilateral confrontation by China, with China, uh, those Indonesias and Vietnams. Will. So I think we, we've played that fairly savvy. Uh, second example is the whole question of Iran in the Gulf with the Saudis, with Bahrain in the context of the Arab Spring. And there I'm, I'm a little... Um, Let's posit them what we've been doing. You know, uh, you know, there is no question that that, and we've seen a lot of it the last couple of weeks. But even before that, that you know, the Iran, 
you know, is posing a serious threat in the region in a variety of ways. Uh, but it's also the case that countries like Saudi Arabia and the Bahrainis are basically saying what dictatorships did to us all over the Cold War, which oh, everything that's going on inside this country is about, is about Iran. Uh, you know, Bahrain may well become about Iran, but only become if we continue to pursue the policies we do, which further radicalizes it uh, and takes away the moderate middle. So in the notion of pushing the, the uh, Bahraini government, I think, harder for reform, it's precisely if you want to keep the Fifth Fleet there. You know, you're more likely to have it three to five years from now if you're on the side of reform. So I think this bridging, and that, that's not about values over interest. That's a strategic sense in a world which we've seen with the explosion of technology where you can't control your message, you can't control information, uh, that we really can't hedge as much on that. We like to hedge, say, you know, well, we're, uh, and, and there I think we're going to have to work out a relationship with the Saudis on terms that won't go back to the status quo ante, where we have a lot of shared interests, and we have some divergent interests, and we need to use our leverage and our bargaining. I mean, I was, you know, wh when they wrote those two op-eds, one in the Post and one in the Times in the spring, taking shots at us, um, and we're kind of going, you know, to Riyadh and sort of trying to make nice, you know, we really need to, 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 to not bash them but make sure that they don't think they can leverage us more than we, le than, than we leverage them. And so it's really how you use your power, not just sort of the quantity of it. Um, I'll ask one question and then we'll open it up. And my question, I think, is of all four of you and is in the general category of um, what can we learn from our own mistakes? And I guess I would just be interested in thinking about liberal and progressive foreign policy thinking and making over the last 20, 30, even 50 years, or, or even you know, since the in the in the post-war period, uh, <clears throat> there have been a lot of twists and turns and a lot of different phases uh, of uh, liberal foreign policy making, uh, at which moments different uh, strains and and types of uh, uh, thought and action were dominant. But what do you think, um, let's say, uh, you know, since the Vietnam era, let's say, um, is, a, is a liberal foreign policy mistake from which we need to learn as we assess and go forward with, and think about the new world? Should we do go in reverse order so I have time to think? <laughs> uh, I would say inferiority complex. You know, the whole soft on thing that, that and, and I think we so much let the other side set the themes in the context for much of the political foreign policy debate that we had to prove that we, that we were tough. And an example of that, I think, and, I, and Steve and Charlie have been doing some really good work on this, was the whole Afghan policy review. You know, in 2009, you know, if you read Bob Woodward's book or other accounts, uh, when, the, when the policy review was done, all of the options were about the numbers of troops. Uh, there wasn't anything about a so-called diplomatic surge. Right? And you even had people like Henry Kissinger writing that you know, ultimately you needed to engage all of the parties in the region uh, and get them to understand that if each pursued their own national interests, India, Pakistan, Iran, China, that they all risk losing and figure out you know, what the diplomatic piece would be. And I think in some respects that was still the sense of you know, uh, because we were withdrawing from Iraq, we couldn't show, we couldn't really think about diplomacy in the Afghan. We're sort of doing that now, but we've lost a couple years. And I think the reason was the worry that we would be seen as soft. And I think it's time to demonstrate that it's more about savvy than toughness. Uh, and you know, that's why I'm, I'm sort of happy to engage with the way the Republicans are setting the agenda. I think, and not just preaching the faithful, I actually think you can reach a lot of average Americans uh, who, who really believe that this is more about you know, to use sports analogies, game plans than just sort of, uh, you know, throwing your power at it. So I, I think it's a good time, as a couple people said, that we really can win this debate, but we have to have a little more confidence in how we see the world and what our own strategies are. Yeah, I would echo that. I think that um, we should be willing to debate this and want this debate uh, because too often we say, well, we want to pivot back to domestic policy, which is our bread and butter. Um, and I think that we should say what we really believe on this, speak to our deepest convictions, and, and not back down from that. Uh, two quick examples, I think, in terms of things we learned from. One that certainly for, for my generation is a defining event is Rwanda. Um, I think we cannot, um, as human beings as well as, as Americans, 
uh, forget that 800,000 uh, plus people were slaughtered um, and we didn't do anything about it. Um, and we had at least some capacity uh, to do that. Um, now, we've also learned um, about the uh, overuse of force and intervention, so we need to balance that. We don't want to overcorrect and then want to jump in everywhere every time that, uh, that someone uh, is, is injured, uh, though that's not a bad impulse to want to prevent um, innocent people from being killed and slaughtered. So I think you know, we cannot forget that that happened, that happened within modern memory. Uh, the other, I think, is is just that threats are real, and I think sometimes that, um, you know, we kind of hope some of these problems will go away, and by not acting, and sometimes with decisive force early, um, these are uh, small wounds that can become infected and become big problems, and one of the ways um, that we have to think about this is how do you prevent uh, yourself, how, how do we prevent our country from getting to the point of impossible decisions? Um, you know, we are facing one very shortly, possibly, um, between a nuclear-armed Iran or a regional war in Iran. Um, what do you do to prevent yourself from getting up to the point that you have two uh, um, uh, incredibly uh, difficult um, uh, world scenarios? So uh, I think we have to think about uh, not um, avoiding these things until they get to the last second, but doing what I think our side is particularly good at, which is uh, preventative diplomacy, use of smart power, et cetera, to not get to, to that point where that extremely difficult decision has to be made. I think that we, we have not been very good at, uh, to use an overused phrase, winning hearts and minds in, in our own country. And, and let me talk about both the, the minds first and then the hearts. Um, I don't think we have a grand strategy. I don't think that there has been a democratic progressive grand strategy in the last 20 years. Uh, and I actually think that's a problem. I think that I, and this, this goes with what Bruce said about, about defensiveness. I think that we have spent a lot of time responding to criticism, saying, I am not a crook, I am not, we are not weak on defense, et cetera, and not nearly as much time articulating, here's what the vision of the world that we want to get to in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years is. Here's what the world that we want our children to inhabit looks like, which then connects back to the, to, the, to the more incremental things. Here's what we need to do next year and the year after and the year after in all these areas. That we, we just haven't done that. We've done a rotten job at it. We consistently conflate uh, laundry lists and strategies. You know, the national security strategy is not a strategy. It's a list of aspirations, good aspirations, but it, but that doesn't help us get anywhere. So one, I think we do need to do that, that hard work of articulating a, a grand strategy, which means a vision of the world and how we get from here to there. Uh, and two, here's the hearts problem. Uh, I, think that, I think that progressives and the left have consistently been too technocratic, which is weird because that, that's not the historic tradition that progressives come out of. Uh, but we need to get better at, at metaphors. We need to get better at narratives. Uh, we need to, I think, and I think that the, the right, unfortunately, has been quite good at that. Has been quite good at coming up with the catchy phrase, the catchy image that hits people here. It was something that George Bush was good at. Ironically, it was something that Barack Obama was exceptionally good at during the campaign uh, and has proven far less good at uh, as a president than as a campaigner. Perhaps we'll get some of that back. And, 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 I, and I think that part of this is a challenge that shouldn't be left to, you know, us experts at all because we tend to be the very people who have not been so great at this, but, you and know. And we tend to be irrelevant. <laughs> and we tend to be, <laughs> oh, come on now. <laughs> but, but I, you know, I almost feel like we should have a little contest of, you know, good metaphors. I mean, even think, even take, uh, just, here's just an example. Here's something I don't think is the right metaphor, but, but just the, the, I'd love to get people thinking in terms of metaphors. When we think about the whole issue, American <coughs> decline, or, you know, boo-hoo, how do we talk about this? Um, and it's certainly true that if you run around saying, oh, America's in decline, you leave yourself wide open to, aha, you hate America. Uh, why do you hate America? Um, you know, I, I, I keep thinking of Gulliver's travels, right? There's Gulliver, and he, you know, first he's in the land of the, what do you call them, the big people, the Brob, Brobdignagians? And that's not much fun. He's getting beat up all the time. It's not fun to be tinier than everybody else. Then he's in the land, he's in Lilliput. It also turns out it's not fun to have everybody be smaller than you. That's that's no good. You have no friends. You keep stepping on other people by accident, which is actually not a bad metaphor for what we've been doing the last decade. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that what's Gulliver's trajectory? Well, he figures out it's nice to be with people who are your own size. And we want to live in, we actually, I think we want to live in a world in which there are more people our own size, more peers and more equals. I don't think that's, that's probably a little too complicated. But I guess what I would solicit from all of you, not necessarily today, but, you know, 
help, help think about what are the narratives and metaphors that help capture that vision of where we want to go, because we need to do a better job at it. Um, I would answer your, your question, Mike, by perhaps borrowing some language from, from Rose's initial comments and, and suggest that progressives, liberals, but actually Americans as a whole should exercise more humility, more patience, more modesty, more realism in, uh, in envisaging the country's role in the world. And that I, I think that at times we, we tend to view the world too much through our own eyes. And we believe that in, in going after a progressive agenda that we can actually envisage a world that starts looking a lot like us. And I think that view that we can go out and socially engineer other countries has, has led us into some of our gravest errors, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, I think that liberals, progressives, truly believed at the beginning of the Arab Spring that suddenly liberal democracy was going to, to flower across the region. And now Islamists seem to be taking power in just about every country. Uh, and, and I don't, you know, that's not us, for us to judge, but I think it should send a signal to us that we should be modest about the degree to which our version of modernity is being embraced around the world. We look at China and we say, well, China's middle class is growing. That means that China will soon democratize. Don't hold your breath, right? It could be generations before China democratizes. It's following its own path based upon its own cultural and geopolitical and, and other kinds of disposition. So especially as we're moving into a world in which uh, American power isn't quite as pronounced as it used to be, I think modesty, uh, humility, and realism would serve the country well. Thank you. We're going to open up the floor and we're going to start with Heather Hurlberg. Thanks. Um, Heather Hurlbert from the National Security Network. And I want to actually reframe Rose's comment as a challenge to the panel. Because, in fact, the only thing that's worse than progressives not having ideas about how to talk about national security is a room full of progressives sitting around throwing out metaphors for a culture that we have to look at ourselves and admit many of us tend to be a little bit um, more out of touch with. But what you've all pointed to is that if we were putting our core issues and priorities out there into the national bloodstream, more metaphors would emerge, which, by the way, is how conservatives do it. Um, you know, our friends who are also conservative wonks with PhDs in, you know, Iranian or Middle Eastern policy did not sit around and come up with any of the slogans that we enjoy. So back to um, Charlie's point about there being no sort of national consensus around where we're going next. If the four of you were writing um, president, the one foreign policy speech that President Obama will give during the re-election campaign, what are the two or three um, concepts that you most want to get out there about what the world should be like? And if we can have a quick round. You can have one concept. You don't have to have two. <laughs> I, you know, I, I mean, it, so this is it's still got to go through the speech writers, right? But it's, it's raw material. It's a, it's a results orientation, right? It's not who does right. it, but how, you know, how do we achieve things that serve our interest nationally and globally? And when you ask the question that way, you know, you really get into notions that, you know, others may have some better ideas than we do. That's not an insult. You know, it's respect. So it's, a, it's, a, it's what works uh, with a pragmatism that's not value free. But what works also relates to how you do democracy. So that, that's my sense is, is you know, is, it's a really, it's a results orientation. Working on it. Um, I think that, uh, um, I think results oriented is a, a good frame. I think that um, right now it's going to be partly a question of also saying who's looking at the threats yet to come. I think that their their um, orientation towards the Pacific is one that doesn't necessarily, um, uh, you know, ha hasn't penetrated the public consciousness. But I think, as someone pointed out, it's not going to be the facts of the policy; it's going to be the theme. Um, so, who's looking out for the next generation of threats? And I think, as progressives, uh, that difference between those who are sort of stuck in the 20th century threats versus those who understand and are addressing the 21st century threats and having a track record uh, to prove it is is maybe part of that pivot. 
I know, Heather, Heather, you've had to endure too many rooms full of people coming up with really bad metaphors. Um, and now you've asked us to do it again. Um, I say two things. One, and uh, Tom points to the importance of a clear-eyed assessment of emerging threats. I think that twinning that with a uh, equally clear-eyed awareness of emerging opportunities and ability to grasp those opportunities. I, I, I think that we, we talk too much about threats, that threats are real. Uh, we don't talk enough about opportunities. That goes back to, you know, what does it mean to have a, a vision of what we do want the world to look like? There are a lot of good things happening out there, which if we stick our head in the sand, uh, bad things will happen to us just as much as if we stick our head in the sand in the face of threats. Um, so, so, so reaching out for opportunities, preparing for threats, reaching out for opportunities, and, and the other theme I think would be of, of connections, connecting and progressing, uh, that the world is interconnected, it's, it's a global neighborhood, uh, and when we, when, we help, when we help make our neighborhood a better, better for our neighbors, we help ourselves. Um, as you can, can tell, Heather, from my, my general remarks, I, I think that we're, we're going through a sea change of sorts domestically on foreign policy. And I think that the, the Republicans may be making a mistake in thinking that Americans want to hear about more and more American power and more and more American commitments. And the reason I think Mr. Paul is actually doing reasonably well is he is tapping into something in the American electorate uh, that is important. And so I would, I would probably focus on how effective Obama has been in going after America's enemies but doing it cheaply and compare the cost of a drone strike, whatever you think of a drone strike, versus the cost of occupying Iraq for 10 years. And I would also focus on what, what Obama calls nation building at home. Uh, and that is domestic uh, investment, rebuilding America's middle class, and tying our foreign policy, particularly the trade promotion agenda, to the degree to which uh, that agenda can, can feed into and bolster the domestic uh, economy. Thank you. Uh, we'll go right here, and we'll, we'll work around the room. And we're not going to ask any more questions to all four panelists. Great. Um, <laughs> I'm Joe Marie Grease Grabber with New Rules for Global yes. Finance. And quickly, uh, one of you talked about commitments versus interests. I'd like to know what are the core interests of the United States? when you talk about U.S. interests. What do you have? How are you defining Great. that in your own head? And in terms of the U.S. spring, I think the challenge is to debunk corporations are people, to retake the political system and let it be owned by people and not by the money. Thanks, Judge Jeremy. So uh, core interests. Let's take a couple more questions. Let's go in the back. Um, I think Stan Kober. In the, yeah, in the bar back there. Stanley Cobra, thanks, Steve. Let me read you a sentence from James Madison, just one. It has grown into an axiom that the executive is the department of power, most distinguished by its propensity to war. Hence, it is the practice of all states, in proportion as they are free, to disarm this propensity of its influence. So we've been talking about democracy and war and how we have to be firm. But in a democracy, which branch of the government should make this decision for war? Okay, Congress and war, and then there was another gentleman over here I saw, right here. And then we'll do the left. Thank you, Yurish uh, Nava, a student from American University. Uh, in the last foreign policy magazine, there was a question about this exceptionalism, and especially the question of the need for reformation of the political system. What is your personal uh, opinion if it's necessary to change some institutional arrangements, especially to be able to um, to to face all these challenges for uh, framing U.S. foreign policy. Great. Thank Core you. interests, branches of government and war and exceptionalism. Rosa. No. Okay. I will let my colleagues figure out our. Okay, core Charlie. Um, <clears throat> you know, on the on the core interests, uh, I think that there's no question that. There are two areas where America's hard power will remain important for the foreseeable future, and that's the Gulf because of the dependence on oil and the Iranian threat, and that means keeping a sizable flotilla <coughs> in that region, and Northeast Asia where the rise of China is 
uh, causing a shift in the balance of power that the United States will have to deal with. Uh, other than, than those issues, there's obviously the, the threat of terrorism, but I, I think we should have a much more confined uh, uh, and hard-headed view of interests beyond those that I just mentioned and be very careful about doing more Libya's, Afghanistan's, and, and uh, uh, ventures where we end up being the fixer of last resort. Those seem to me to be expensive propositions that go well beyond our core interests. Um, I think that there are lots of, of fixes that, uh, that one can take. I mean, I think that you and your question said that we need the American people to retake the political system. Most Americans feel very distant from the government, very distant from democratic institutions. Uh, and I don't think that there is a, a silver bullet, but I do think that Obama is headed in the right direction when he speaks to the broad mass of, Ameri of the American public and says, we need a system that advantages you and not a system that advantages the special interests and uh, the, the people who are, who are uh, most advantaged. What can you do about that? Uh, I think that, you know, politically speaking, there are lots of little, little fixes that you can do, none of which alone is that, that important, but when they add up, they may make a difference, such as dealing with campaign finance, such as dealing with congressional redistricting, such as trying to find perhaps an, a way of using the Internet or, or other modes to, to, to make democracy feel more personal and more responsive. I think one could come up with a whole list of things and try to string together a set of reforms that might make a difference. Tom? Yeah, I would just say on interests, uh, the national security, uh, the security of our nation and its people, um, the health and well-being of our citizens and, and our values, um, and those play out in a number of ways. In terms of domestic political reform, I think you could take any issue across the board and say uh, we will be hard-pressed to address the scale of the problems we face until we massively change the way we finance elections, redistricting, and I was saying in the context of Rose's article, really try to redefine and re-energize democracy in this country uh, in a new century. And I, I, having gone on the inside for two years in Congress, um, it is worse than anything you imagine from the outside, and I know you <laughs> imagine uh, terrible things. On the Congressional War Powers question, there's obviously a constitutional question there. Um, there's also a functional question, which is when people have to vote for something, they take ownership over that decision in a different kind of way. And I think I want to draw an, a very quick analogy on this to what President Obama was able to do with the Libya intervention in forcing our allies not just to give rhetorical support, but to actually cast votes uh, in favor of uh, justifying this intervention. At times when that was starting to look like it might drag on and might be um, a very different scale of intervention than people uh, had hoped, um, you saw people wanting to run for the exits. You saw some of the regional allies who had helped to legitimize it, as well as some of those in Europe. When you've put people on the record for something, they take that vote very seriously. Uh, I can tell you from my own experience with that. Um, and so I think whether we're talking about the, co the balance of powers within the U.S. or what it means to actually get allies involved, um, I think there is a, a really important accountability element of forcing people to go on the record, um, whether it's other countries or uh, within our own on that. And you saw it with Congress, where where some of the voices that had been most beating the drum to do the Libya intervention then turned around and voted against uh, that authorization, a pretty uh, phenomenal uh, political act of, of uh, hypocrisy. So, you know, the, the interest question is really interesting because it's really hard to go beyond, you know, Tom's um, general ones or, or, or Charlie's particular areas. I mean, let's, let's think about a country called Afghanistan, which after we got the Soviets out, we didn't think was, was important anymore. Uh, and then proved to be extremely important, you know, in 9-11. Uh, if there was to be an H1N1 virus, you know, breaking out, you know, in Eastern Africa suddenly. So even, from, even when I've been in, you know, in, in the State Department and elsewhere in the policy world, it's really hard to sort of define them in a, in a fixed kind of way. Which brings us back to this theme about, you know, how do you reduce the standing vulnerabilities you have at home? So energy security, environmental sustainability, competitive economy, those are things that in a classic realist sense are sort of self-help you can do for yourself. So since you can't totally control what's going to happen out there, it's all the more reason to, to, to focus on the domestic foundations and reduce those vulnerabilities that are largely about what we do for ourselves, not what others do to us. And it brings us back to, to the question of how you sort of fix things. And this might be a better answer to your question, Heather, than before. I mean, I think it's really about sort of how we compete in a global era. 
It's a global era. It's not just China. There's all sorts of countries out there. Uh, and we need to effectively compete economically, technologically, with ideas in a variety of ways. That to me actually speaks to the American exceptionalism debate, can get people excited, you know, sort of a sense of what we need to do. Uh, but when you think about that, some of the barriers are our inability to do any kind of, you know, long-term strategy. Uh, and this has a lot to do with the way Congress operates or, you know, James Madison, Federalist Number 10, you know, about the power of interest groups. What would Madison think if he read Politico today, you know? Uh, so I think, I think we really need, we're in a world in which other countries, frankly, you know, if you look at some of Brazil's strategies or even some of China's strategies in areas like alternative technologies, not, you know, in terms of competing in these areas, we need to really compete in a global era. And there's a whole lot of, of challenges there that are, that are part of our domain uh, to fix or not to fix for what we do for ourselves at home. Uh, right up here in the front, Jordan. My name's Li Yang. Uh, I'm very happy to hear this panelist uh, about democracy promotion. I think that's a very good phrase. I've been years and decades uh, trying to say promote even fairness. I think we usually say about the democracy, what we have, uh, freedom, that other country feel uh, jealous about us. But I don't think this panel would agree with that. I think we had to really promote and uh, tell the real uh, reality is what we have and what's the weakness we have. And uh, I have uh, presented but the problem we, we can... We need to get to your question. The, my question yeah. would be, say, can we really have real action to remedy the weakness that we have? For instance, can we really, uh, say, do some cost effectiveness or do we have to prosecute abuse and waste and corruption and it was within maybe three branches and maybe even four branches because there's overlaps. So your, your issue is how do you achieve cost effectiveness in government, right? Cost effectiveness okay. or eliminate those corruptions. Got it. And make us real democracy. Got it. Thank you. So how can we make our democracy real democracy? Mel Guzner? Hi, I'm Merrill Guzner with the Fiscal Times. I've written a lot about budget deficits. Uh, Romney is talking about in the Republicans an 8% increase if you project out over the coming year as opposed to an 8% decline, and this is over previous projections. And you mentioned, Dr. Kupchin, that, you know, the Americans do sort of respond to chest thumping in electoral terms, whatever the economic underlying reality is. Mm -hmm. So I guess this is really a framing question uh, to, s to couch uh, the coming military build-down in terms of uh, the necessity for one in terms of our economic weakness in home and needing to balance budgets and all of that, seems to me to, you know, be a different counter to that argument. What's a better counter that sort of says America would benefit around the world by having a smaller military footprint in the decade Great, great ahead? question. How do you turn it? Uh, ben Barber? Um, yeah, Ben Barber, McClatchy Newspapers. Um, perhaps for Mr. Gentleson, um, given the fact that so many jobs are going abroad, and in reality, in a, in a completely open labor market, you can always find uh, some people in China or India to do our jobs for 10 cents on the dollar or a penny on the dollar. Uh, how can we ever overcome that? So competitiveness, uh, right here, uh, the lady in white. Hello, thank you. My name is Guyan. I'm a reporter with RT, and I have a question for Dr. Kopchin. Use and a, your loud voice. I'm um, sorry. And Dr. Gentleson. Uh, thank you. By the way, it, w it was a very interesting panel. My question is regarding Iran, um, the sanctions, the crippling sanctions against Iran. Do you think they will help to turn the Iranian people against their government? And the other, the other question that also has to do with Iran, the execution of this American um, convicted of espionage in Iran, could that possibly become the spark that would cause an all-out confrontation? And overall, do you have a sense that this powder keg of tension over Iran is waiting for a spark to explode. Thank you. And we'll take one last one from Diane in front. And you're going to be really fast. Okay. Um, okay. Um, just in addition to um, smart power, hard power, soft power diplomacy, um, also uh, consideration of um, un analyzing the other underlying conflict using tension reduction, not using fear. And Mr. Jenelson, you just mentioned we need to compete in the global market, but what about also do we need to learn how to cooperate and more? So a question about cooperation, Iran, uh, getting corruption out of government, 
Chinese cheap labor and uh, Meryl Guzner's great question about how do you make decline sound, uh, sound good. <laughs> Charlie? Well, I think that, uh, you know, for starters, you probably don't talk about decline. Uh, they, you know, the, the Republicans will continue to want to tag you with this, this thing, and, and I think we need to, to develop a, a language that is about the renewal of America, about investing at home, about the importance of, of rebalancing our commitments and interests, uh, all as part of a, of a dialogue that includes fiscal responsibility. Uh, and I, I do think that Obama has a very large window that he can walk through, left open to him by the Republicans, uh, in the sense that I think any reasonable person needs, uh, understands that we need a, a responsible mix of budget cuts, tax increases, and domestic investment to bring the country back to life economically. Uh, and I think that the uh, the scaling back of the defense budget has to be a part of that, that broader dialogue. Uh, coming to the question uh, about, about cheap labor abroad, yeah, I think it is a huge part of this conversation in the sense that I think the most important reason that, uh, that wages, middle class wages in this country have been stagnant for two decades is because of globalization. Because precisely as you said, uh, it's hard for the American worker to keep pace when jobs are, are moving abroad, and that's depressing wages. Uh, and only a domestic strategy of investment, of re-education, uh, is, I think, uh, going to solve that problem. Uh, finally, on Iran, you know, we're, I think we're definitely in a, in a dangerous zone. Uh, I hope that the Iranians are not stupid enough to attack an American ship or drive a small boat into the side of an American cruiser, because I think that does have the potential to, to quickly escalate. I don't think that the United States is looking for a fight right now. I do think the United States might be willing to use force in the not too distant future, depending on what happens. And I think that this move to the, to the Qum facility is a dangerous one because it is much more difficult to carry out a military strike on that facility than in existing facilities. And if they kick out the inspectors, which they may do, I think it will create a lot of pressure in <coughs> Israel and in the United States for the potential use of, of force. Do I, do I think that uh, these sanctions are going to turn the Iranian people against the Iranian regime? I'm not sure it matters. And that's because the Iranian regime seems to have demonstrated sufficient ruthlessness to keep down the opposition. Any last comments, Rose? Uh, the only one I'll, I'll comment on is, is how do we how do we make a decline sound good and a shrinking military sound good? And uh, I, I I agree. I think you, you you don't frame it as decline. I actually think on this one that that we could do a lot worse than, than use the same script that the, the right has been using in terms of talking about, uh, you know, ordinary family has to balance its budget, has to, at least over the long term, uh, you know, has to, and we've been going through a period in which ordinary people have had to think real hard about uh, are you, is, and when you look at your spending, are you spending only on what you need? Or are you spending on all sorts of things that you don't need that are unnecessary, that are irrelevant? And this, I think, is Charlie's point about uh, the scope of our commitments militarily now exceeds the scope of our interests, even if you define our interests in a relatively broad sense. So it's time to you know, put, our, put our house in order in that sense and say, wait a second, some of these things are not things that we actually need. Whereas because we're spending so much on these things we don't actually need, we're not spending on things that we do need. Thank you. First of all, I think in addition to a, a normative question about whether we should cut the budget, I think it's also important to have the facts, which is that there's one reason that the sequestration cuts are out there, which is that the Republicans were more interested in protecting millionaires than protecting the military. Um, that choice was on the table. So the question of what should be done in sort of an intellectual sense here is different from let's be honest about that reality. That choice was on the table for serious structural deficit reduction, uh, and uh, that was rejected over and over again. So I think it's important to understand that. On the competitiveness challenge, 
Uh, Jeffrey Sachs has a new book out. I haven't read it yet. I did read a couple of his op-eds around it talking about this point that in the 80s we were convinced that the threat was government when the threat was globalization in terms of our competitiveness strategy. Um, there's certainly a lot of history behind his thinking on that, not just looking in the U.S. context but abroad. And I do think that it's the level of rethink that we have to do if we're going to get serious about uh, competitiveness um, is to understand it in, in that context. On Iran, you know, I, I, I will leave that to, to experts, but we'll only say that I think this is an incredibly serious situation, and I do think the ball right now is in Iran's court. I think this administration has given plenty of space for um, uh, diplomacy and other things to work. I think the stakes of what we're talking about now are incredibly serious, and I think we're, uh, you know, th th there, there are moves that need to be made here very soon, or I think that that spark is a very real possibility. So really quickly, on, on the declinism, you know, it's the, it's the problem is not declinism, it's denialism. We're about renewal, it means recognizing the problem and dealing with it, not just lamenting it. You know, the notion of American exceptionalism is a stimulant, not, not just as an anesthetic. Uh, on the jobs question, so a little, little promotion. I, I've been writing a monthly column with a colleague who's a New York City investor on Huffington Post we call the bisectoralists, which is about how, you know, private and public sectors need to work together. And our last one we did a couple weeks ago, I used the example, uh, we, we have a cottage up in the Blue Ridge Parkway in the district next to Tom's old district. And I get to walk the Blue Ridge Parkway, you know, and, and it's the twofer, right? In the 1930s, it created jobs. And 80 years later, it's the backbone of the Virginia and North Carolina tourism industry. You know, I think, I think smart public sector spending is crucial to how we do this. On cooperation and Iran, I mean, it's a good example. So take Turkey as an example. You can compete in a global era and still cooperate with others. You know, I think we've been working much better with Turkey lately than we did back in, in the whole Iran uh, nuclear issue, which I think was as much our fault as it was, you know, Turkey and Brazil's. You know, we're, we're working with Turkey on Syria. Uh, we're, le we're finding ways to cooperate, you know, looking, listening to others' ideas. And, you know, amidst everything else, Iran has indicated that they'd like to start talks again in, in Turkey. You know, is that a stalling tactic? We don't know. But I think just writing it off would be wrong. It is a very dangerous situation. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we need to respond to deter them as well as pursue cooperation. Uh, but we also need to avoid that soft on thing. We need to think this through strategically uh, and not worry about what others outside are saying about us because it's a classic crisis uh, that has to be dealt with. Uh, but we don't want it to spin out of control. Uh, uh, you know, we, we'd like to get it to resolution. You know, I'm not betting my next mortgage payment that we will, but we can't write that off either. Thank you. But as we close, you know, I, I want to just throw out a couple of items. And, and I think Mel's uh, question is, is so important now as we talk about national security questions and budgets and strategy and, and you know, what is the, 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 the progressive game plan? If, is there coherence? If you, if you use as a measure of what Americans felt they needed to spend as a measure of security before 9-11, the defense budget that preceded 9-11 is a pretty good figure. So if you look at that and you look at uh, the amount accounting for inflation over time, we have spent since 9-11 $2.3 trillion above what Americans felt they needed to, uh, to feel safe. In the private sector, that equates to about 6.5 million jobs. So we are at this point of hard choices when you begin trying to frame and think about what's going on that, that and I think um, Bruce's comment about an inferiority complex or insecurity to be so important because the response from the Democratic Party I'm an independent, but from, from Charlie and others, but Charlie was not in, in the group. But the large institutional response from the, the institutions of the Democratic Party was to try and hug the Pentagon more tightly than the Republicans were. It was to, you know, ha hug a general day. Uh, basically set up, you know, new institutions that essentially were trying to validate and initiate um, uh, all sorts of things. It, it, it built around armor for soldiers, but then it went on and on and on. But the narrative was not one that you critique the Pentagon. And I tried to raise this issue the other day because it's very interesting when you listen to Leon Panetta talk about security, it's very interesting because he is a numbers guy. He's, he, when we saw him in Halifax, he talked about, you know, defense in the age of austerity. And essentially, if you have declining dollars, the sense you get is you're going to have declining security. You can't achieve greater security deliverables with less money. And I went back and got a lot of hate mail for it, but I went back to Donald Rumsfeld. He was one of the last secretaries of defense to really shake up the generals and to sort of say, we need to change the way we achieve security, create efficiencies, use the revolution in military affairs, apply information technology, create new narratives on how you're going to achieve security. Um, why you may or may not be spending spending uh, uh, more money at the time, 
uh, there were budgetary constraints. He denies that. But, but I said we need to go back to that because there was a way that we talked about security and defense and achieving something more even if there were some fundamental institutional or financial constraints. It's a really important lesson because the, 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 you know, when you talk to the, the last comment I'll make is the metaphor I use to tell people where America is at and where, what its hopes can be is that we're the general motors of nations. Very well branded, sprawling capacity. You always hear from generals, we have, you know, we've got the greatest intelligence network in the world. We can project power in the world. We've got all of these assets. America is still great. Well, General Motors was too. And, and that's the problem. Can you rewire, refame, and re-energize a, a, a sprawling firm and do it? And that's the challenge. And I think that's the, that's the muck we're trying to do. I want to thank uh, Charlie, Rosa, Tom, and Bruce, and Michael Tomaski and Democracy, a Journal of Ideas, uh, for sponsoring today's program. Thank all of you for uh, watching online and being with us today. But a round of applause to all of you. Thank you very much. <laughs>